Good morning and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for, for February 25th, 2019. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopheide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is the anticipatory cyber defense via predictive analytics, machine learning, and simulation. And this is presented by uh, Rochester Institute of Technology's Jay, Jay Yang. Uh, before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box. So if you click on the chat icon and you type your question here, uh, we'll be following the chat during the presentation but we also have time at the end uh, for, for, for questions as well. And uh, Jay wanted me to note that some of the slides he will be going over in a high level. And so if you have more questions and you'd like to dig into them more, we could go back uh, at the end of the presentation and dig into that. And with that, uh, I will hand the presentation over to Jay. Jay, welcome. Thank you. Um... Yep, I can hear you. Go ahead. Getting me to share. All right. Um, can everyone see this okay? Yep, looks good. Thank you, Jeanette. Uh, it's a pleasure to give this webinar today. I hope that through this presentation, we as a community can open up more dialogue on how to elevate cyber defense in terms of to anticipate what adversary can do, will do, uh, instead of waiting for things to happen, right? As I will be presenting videos of our three prototypes, Capture, Assert, and Cascades, I certainly would love to hear your feedback on um, the features that make sense, it doesn't make sense, and so on and so forth, and look for uh, potential collaborators, right? Uh, before I start, I do want to thank Florence uh, to connect me with this uh, series and allow me to present this to a broader audience. Thank you, Florence. And you can see a number of students uh, who have worked on this project, projects, I should say. Uh, this, what I'm presenting today is a combination of many projects. I, we started working on Cyber SA back in 20, 2005 with it, the Air Force Lab. And since then, we have several number of projects. So there's a lot of students that we have engaged. The one listed here only is the last few, few years. And I also have a lot of collaborators over the years. And certainly that the majority of the research describing this talk was supported and supported by NSF, IRPAR, and NSA. Um, okay. So let's get started. So let's face it, uh, <laughs> the people in this audience probably I'm preaching to a choir, will be attacked. There's no 100% bulletproof uh, security, right? It's just a matter of when, where, how, and what. So what can we do about it? Should we get up, give up? No, uh, absolutely not. So think about we as human, uh, human being. We actually like to anticipate. I mean, I don't know about you, I like to anticipate a lot, right? So when you see something, when you see something, you perceive, you comprehend the situation, and then you anticipate. We would like to anticipate the ball is coming towards me and hitting me, so I catch the ball. I'm anticipating that the way I walk this uh, crossroad that I won't be hit by a car. We anticipate a lot. It is our human nature. So it's very surprising that we as a community, we have not done a lot, at least not sufficiently, to think about what's the limit? How can we anticipate? How can we predict the future before the critical loss of information or mission got impact, right? So what have been done? Um, there are a lot of works. I'm only citing two sets of works here. One is actually for me and my, my research lab. It's a variable length Markov models we developed back in the 2005 to eight timeframe. We'll continue to build on a little bit. Uh, basically is using Markovian property uh, to look at observables. When we say observables here, we meant intrusion alerts. And I'll talk a little bit more about that and how we use that in the future. So we're not dealing with packet captures, we're dealing with intrusion alerts. And a lot of this bro, suricata, snore, and other kinds of alerts, logs out there uh, already telling us what might be happening. And based on what might be happening, we'll try to predict what might be in the future. 
So those set of work has shown some robustness. You can see the table on the left that there are some performance going down in the step number nine and step number 10, but later on you can bring back up. So there's some resilience over there in this uh, kind of method. Uh, certainly there are some limitations there. We can talk about it if we have time in coming back. The other set of work is uh, MITRE has done a work on site graph. This is a build on George Mason University's work to uh, this attack graph based uh, prediction framework. Uh, over there is mostly modeling that uh, uh, different entities, different objects that's related to cyber attacks use that to uh, derive what might be happening in the future based on domain knowledge, uh, uh, expert knowledge. So for me, we as a group, all my research group and my collaborators and I, we feel the key challenges are really, you can think about like three uh, buckets. The first bucket is, can we forecast? I use the word forecast here instead of predict or anticipate. I use the word forecast because drawing the for weather forecasting. Weather forecasting, you now they should be looking at a day, three days, a week from now, 10 days from now, so that's the type of forecast I'm thinking about, really forecasting within the next week or so, would there be anything happening on my organization? What kind of things? And this kind of forecasting, you will not be depending on intrusion alerts because things hasn't happened yet. So it'll be depending on some kind of seemingly unrelated signals. We'll talk to people about that next. Second type, second bucket. So instead of forecasting a few days, a week down the road, we should be thinking about, can we quickly recognize and separate evidences, intrusion alerts, I mean, uh, recognizing behaviors by separating alerts. A lot of uh, people in the, in the SOG and uh, really practitioners tell us that it is just too many, too overwhelming, right? With all these intrusion alerts, many of them are not important. So can we separate out, divide and conquer, really looking at the critical ones together and see what kind of critical attack behaviors uh, out there and then use that information to do a better, more effective prediction. And this prediction will be in the next seconds, next minute, next hour, not days and weeks. Finally, the third bucket is that we all know that we have only limited data, only limited observations, only limited observation of adversary behaviors. So you could ask the question, can we synthetically generate things that make sense, may not be totally real, but scenarios that might happen, so for us to do what if analysis, right? So those are three buckets I'm gonna talk about. I have three prototypes, each one address each of the three buckets. So if you don't believe me yet, um, uh, you can say, no, nah, I'm just gonna work on one single vulnerabilities, one single problems on my server, my system, my software, my web browser. What I'm doing here is uh, behavior over time, a broad progression over time. If you don't believe me that this is changing, this is evolving, I have some data to show you. During the collegiate penetration testing competition that was hosted in RIT, uh, this data was from 2017. We have 2018 data as well. What I'm showing you here, the y-axis represents the different uh, types of exploit and scanning uh, and their volume over time, the X axis represent kind of over time, you can see that the composition of different types and the volume of them for each of the two teams, here are two different teams in the competition, eight and nine. Uh, already the composition of uh, uh, alert, uh, exploits and scanning already are different within each team over time and also very different across teams. So there are some differences. So it's not a very trivial problem to say, oh, everyone's gonna do X, everyone could do Y. People are doing things differently and that they're changing their strategies over time, depending on what they see along the way, okay? So to this end, hopefully I convinced you about, um, there are some challenges. And um, first of all, we, we as human, we want to be able to anticipate, forecast, predict, simulate. And second of all, that there are challenges and not trivial. So let me show you what we have done. And we're not totally done yet, but what we have done. So the three systems uh, uh, presenting in front of you, capture, assert, and cascades. Capture is a forecasting and warning generation system that forecasts a couple of days, a few days, maybe a week uh, down the road, what things might happen based on, un we call it unconventional signals. 
assert means that we want to make assertion of some critical behaviors based on collection of alerts. Divide and conquer, separate evidences, but grouping them into some critical behaviors that might be helpful for prediction. Cascades is we want to generate synthetic simulated data, cascading on um, the scenario that might happen, extrapolating scenario that might happen for us to do better what if analysis. All right, I'm going to talk about each one of them in the next uh, probably 20 minutes, uh, 30 minutes or so. First is capture. So capture, um, this problem is that, well, if we want to forecast future cyber attacks that has yet happened, so no intruding alerts, nothing has been observed yet, what can we depend on? Uh, this is an IAPAR funded project called COST program, C-A-U-S-E COST program. This program costs to, for us to look at um, very unconventional in cybersecurity sense, uh, open source and maybe dark web signals. So you can see I listed a few uh, in the bottom of the slide here, Twitter, GDL, dark web, OTX, Hank McGadden, and so on so for news, all those things. So we have collaborators. Uh, we as a group that myself that in RIT, we don't collect all those data. Some of them we could, but not all of them. Um, so our partners collect many of the signals and we process a very, very large number of signals. The most recent release, we have about four, five, six hundred signals, maybe from about 10 data sources. Uh, for, for the, to be, to, as a disclaimer, right now, the one I presented here does not contain dark web as a data source uh, as a signal. Only uh, some Twitter, GDL, News, uh, ODX, and some other data. Okay, so there's a very large number of signals. Unfortunately, you can imagine most of the signals are not going to be significant, are not going to be have very strong predictive power. Well, if so, then a lot of people already are doing this. Um, not individually, but maybe collectively. The question is how collectively. Also, you can imagine what is the lag? When I say lag, I mean how far early, how earlier the signal will have an effect to indi indicative of a future uh, incidence. Think about someone complaining on the Twitter, something is uh, not good with RIT. Does that really mean RIT will be attacked? And how long ago, it's like a week ago, a month ago, a few days ago, that, that is a lag time, the time elapsed between the actual uh, complaint and the actual incidence, right? So how long would that be? What kind of legs? And also that you can imagine this kind of relationship probably is not going to be very stationary, not going to be very, it won't be the same over time, right? So, and, and adversaries, some of them are intended actors, some of them are kind of just one, one, one um, very ad hoc hackers that may not be very uh, stationary kind of relationships. So deal with this, that Capture has looked at uh, a multiple methods in machine learning uh, in general and looking at what kind of things we can do. So the, the three things that's very important that I'm indicating here, one is the signal imputation. What that means is actually a lot of people deal with this, incomplete data. The signals are not complete. Signals are event-driven. Signal incidents are event-driven. So we may not have signals all the time and they're not necessarily correct and so on and so forth. So you need to think about a way to do imputation. Second of all is uh, how do we deal with, uh, let's say, 500 signals with up to 60 legs, so it's 500 times 60, many, many, many possible features. How would you select the right features in such a large number while you don't have a lot of incidents to base on and determine what features are important, right? And uh, this relationship between the features, uh, relevant data and uh, incidents need to be very dynamic and look at what period of times, uh, there might be multiple periods time periods, they are relevant uh, between the signal and the broadcast event. So by looking at all of these options, we have developed, uh, we actually have a couple uh, iterations of our uh, system. And the version one, what I'm showing you is close to the latest version we have. And in this version, um, I'm, we have the following components. We have what we call entropy-based late feature selection. It's less for feature selection mechanism but we're looking at uh, the late features so that we can deal with a large, very large number of features and their legs. We're also looking at this notion of concept drift, which is something that uh, 
uh, people uh, uh, have used for machine learning in general, but we're looking at Hansa Drift in this case and looking at what period of time and multiple period, time periods where we can use for model training. We also think that this is very, very important, not just to forecast, but providing some kind of a reasoning rationale to describe how does a forecast, uh, is, how, how a forecast is being generated. Uh, how do you explain the correct and the incorrect forecasts, right? And of course that you want to have the dial functionality where you allow the, the adjustment of uh, to have a better uh, pos false positive or better uh, false negative, right? And then you also want to deal with uh, multi-day ahead forecast. In the next slide, I'm gonna show you a video. So I'm gonna use this opportunity to explain to you what you might be looking at. So you'll be looking at the output of a, a software prototype where the bars in the beginning will be gray. Gray means a forecast. You're not seeing a gray here, this is just a, this is just a screenshot. But in, a, in the video, you'll see gray. Gray means being forecasted. When gray turn to colors, whether it's blue, or red, that means it's correct or incorrect. You can see a red dot on the top and red dot at the bottom. The red on the dot, top and bottom representing the true and false. Right now, we're only presenting, demoing only the binary forecasting, yes or no, whether there's a, some kind of attack happening on a particular target organization. If it's on top, that means true. Yes, there is at least one. And then if it's a button, no, not, nothing on that day, on uh, February 4th, uh, nothing happened on that day, okay? So as you see that the blue one will represent the correct ones, the red one represent the incorrect ones. The darker red means uh, false negative, not as critical in my opinion. Uh, the very bright red, you didn't see this on, on the screen, will be uh, uh, false uh, negative. There will be a worst case, okay? All right, so, and then on the right hand side, you see this kind of uh, uh, histogram that show up. These are the different signals with their legs. Uh, representing for particular forecast, helping us to explain what happened. You can see some uh, red boxes here. Actually, is uh, red boxes just to help highlight. You can see some differences between a very dark green and a very light green, uh, maybe a teal. And that difference means the difference as, as compared to previous day's signals, allowing us to analyze what happened, what changes uh, between those signals being used to explain the forecasting differences. All right, so what I'll put in here are the confidence of having an attack or not having an attack. All right, so for this video demo, it's gonna be short. Um, we are actually looking at a target organization with some kind of codename knocks. And this is a particular type of uh, uh, attack, malicious email, email that contain malicious content, malicious uh, links and so on and so forth. The training period for what we're showing here is between November 2016 to February 2018. The testing period is March 2018, about a year ago, right? The signal lakes that we're looking at is the 15 days for 400 plus signals in this case, and the forecasting for the next seven days. You can see there are seven gray bars there, right? Uh, Jeanette, please feel free to interrupt me if I'm not explaining well on what people are looking at on the screen. Yes, uh, so far it looks like it's, people are understanding it. All right, sounds good. I'm gonna click the button. You will see what you will see is that uh, as we continue to uh, broadcast seven days ahead uh, with their confidences and something will change because new evidence come in, some forecasts will change. On the top of the screen is our baseline, still a pretty good system, a base net system. And on the bottom is capture. Capture is more advanced with this, uh, uh, what we call the ELF, a uh, late feature selection, as well as concept drift kind of selection. And comparing the top and bottom, at the end when everything settles, will we'll pop up the um, uh, F measure. And uh, the, you may not see this very clearly, but for the baseline, base net, the F measure for this testing period is 0.64, and for capture it's 0.77, a better performance. What you're showing on the screen now is the provenance, signal provenance. We're looking at some of the big differences between the two. I'm gonna pause a little bit, explain what we're trying to see here. All right. So what happens here is that if you focus on um, March 15 and March 16, March 15 and March 16, March 15 is a true, is a positive, meaning there is at least one attack. Same thing for March 16. The baseline base net does not do well in for March 16. It's a bright red, that means a false negative. The confidence using the, the naive base, base net does not produce a high enough confidence 
to tell the system that it's good. Our capture, on the other hand, did well, has a very good high confidence. And we're looking at why that's the case, why did we do well? And there was a difference in the next day that it goes down, the March 17th, it goes down, right? So these are the differences in the signal. Again, the very light teal kind of color represent the difference between the signal from the previous day, uh, signals collected from the previous day for the signals compared to the signals collected of the current day. You can see some differences here that allow us to explain, rationalize what happened, why are we correct, why are we incorrect. Okay? I'm going to let the, the video run to the end. So this allows to not only have a pretty good uh, system with a very good performance, F major 0.77, but also allowing to analyze and understand what was the reason that our forecast was correct or incorrect, right? So to give you a little bit of overall performance that we have achieved with this uh, uh, version one capture, uh, what I'm showing here is a summary of performance in F measures for two different attack types. The one you saw was just for one month uh, and one attack type. These are for two different attack types, five month worth of testing period and on their F measure and precision and recall. And this is the, for the same target organization NOS. In this testing result reported results, we use 146 signals from eight data sources with up to 60 days of lags. And what we have seen is that Overall, we have achieved pretty good F measures 0.7 to 0.8 range for all of these cases that we show on the top in the table, except a couple cases here for January 2018 and December 2017 for malicious email. Not, not, nothing can be done well. Is the performance pretty bad 0.4 range? This is uh, almost unpredictable. We are still analyzing why that's exactly the case, uh, but uh, basically, if for the cases we could forecast, we did pretty well, we improved the performance. And we show that what are the relevant signals that were used um, to kind of, uh, uh, for this forecast, you can see at the bottom of the figure here, we use Avis, Gdelt, uh, kind of different kind of exploit DB, Twitter, uh, sentiment and different kind of verisign, different kind of uh, uh, data sources to look at what lakes. And in this particular testing, it seems like GDL instability seems to be kind of indicative uh, more. Uh, and one thing that we notice is that not all the lakes are the same, but are pretty similar in what lakes each signal were used, uh, even if you change the, the testing period. All right. So overall, the performance is pretty good. I think that at least this gives us an idea. Ah, there is a chance. There is a chance that to do forecasting may not be 95% accurate, may not be 98% accurate. This is not uh, image recognition. This is not uh, task recognition. This is really something that very, very little have been done. I think that we need to think about a way uh, to kind of work with analysts uh, on saying what's valuable to you, even though it's between 70, 80% kind of F measure. Okay, which is harmonic in between precinct and recall. Uh, right. One, so, yeah. one second, I got a couple questions here. Yeah. Uh, so what machine learning method is used for capture V1? Right. So uh, it is the, the, the base system is a Bayesian network. Okay, so that's why we compare to baseline of base net with no additional features. Uh, so we use base net, but we added base net with a feature selection that Lake feature selection, I'll go back a few slides. We added onto the base net with uh, entropy based lag feature selection, okay? And we added a concept drift. These are all customized based on, um, in the machine learning world, you have concept drift that, that deal with classifiers. You have uh, this feature selection that, that do, and then we modify it, we, we deal with them and kind of integrate it with base net together. Does that answer your question? Uh, I'll wait for a reply. Okay. But uh, in the meantime, we've got another question. Can we know what emails are problematic? Uh, what are the problems? For example, a scam, malware, uh, who are the victims? So uh, in, in this slide, actually, I have an EM and ME. EM actually is an endpoint malware. And then ME stands for malicious email. 
uh, these are actually coded by uh, the testing team of the cost project to say, hey, here for this organization, these are the endpoint malware that actually being reported and these are the malicious that are being reported. What that means in a very high level, malicious email means that the email contain a link, yeah, and a very, uh, uh, may, maybe a, a attachment, maybe some of these are reported as a, using email as a means to get to the end users. Endpoint malware means a detection of a malware that's sitting on a system. So that's considered an incident. So those are the two different types of attacks that was coded by the testing team of the cost program. All right, so should I continue? Yep, looks like everybody's on the same page. Yeah. I think that loading the video, I need to go out and come back in to help on the not having that glitch. Do it again. Okay. So that was our first system captured. The idea there is to forecast the future of in a few days, a week or so. A third, our second prototype deal with how do we divide and conquer, how do we separate evidence in a timely manner so that we can recognize those emerging attack behaviors that we use for prediction. So here, because it's timely, um, we, uh, we need to use some kind of a way to generate empirical attack models. We just combine Bay, uh, Bayesian learning and the cluster, uh, clustering algorithm together. And so that we can kind of have this iterative process as uh, evidence is intrusion alert comes in, we can recognize in these models and, and update the models as we go. And I'll come back to talk about some of these detailed, uh, 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 this the theoretical details there. They include uh, how do we use a divergent, chaos divergence, divergence entropy. Um, maybe the next slide will talk a little bit more about that. So uh, an important part of this is that we want to recognize non-trivial behaviors. What we meant by that is we're not trying to group uh, alerts that are similar. So alert aggregation is not our purpose. We want to look at uh, a unit as collection of alerts. And that collection of alerts exhibits some kind of behavior and we can represent as non-parametric uh, uh, histograms. For example, we consider um, some of these uh, features that may be of interest. For example, time elapsed between alerts. Uh, for example, uh, <clears throat> we look at the type of service being targeted. We look at how targets have changed we look at the types of a scan and type of exploits. We look at the kill chain stage and so on and so forth. We look at those features and we, because we use those features, you can imagine they're all categorical features and they're not necessarily parameterized or people do not have any real model to say, what is the time elapsed between alerts? Are they, do they follow a Poisson distribution? Do they follow something else? So we're using non-parameterized histograms in a way to, uh, recognize this collection of alerts together. Furthermore, we feel that it's very important to understand that there might be cases you haven't seen at this time T yet, but we don't want to totally rule it out. You think about it, if we want to categorize a particular group of alerts that hasn't shown a particular feature value yet, it doesn't mean that you will never happen the next time T plus. So we want to, we use this notion of entropy redistribution to accommodate that we can classify a collection alerts into a model, even though the model says it's zero probability of something happening. We can still categorize them into the model and make corrections as we go. So what I'm gonna show you is another video uh, kind of showing how a search works. So this is first showing you that we're running a CERN and we're looking at WGI index to look at how good it is over time. These are the results of uh, one run. This was done quite a few months ago uh, of, of a run that shows the different models. You can see this model, 22, uh, model two with 44 collection of alerts in there. And then this gives you different kind of uh, uh, attribute values to understand the different um, uh, kind of uh, uh, what kind of feature values are there, the different signatures, the different kind of distribution port, um, and you can customize the different features in there, can look at different teams. I'm gonna pause here a little bit. So the timeline here, uh, we'll go back a little bit and show you what I wanted to say. So 
so on the top right corner are the older histogram, which are configurable, different kind of features you can use in our system. On the left-hand side, the top, you already saw this, the more topology representing uh, what, what uh, IP address was attacked by what other IP addresses. The bottom here is a very interesting, is a timeline representing all the alerts, all the evidences by the different teams in the collegiate penetration testing competition I was talking about. And we're only showing three teams here, so only three colors. You can, you can do some customization or visualization to see it. But one thing that's interesting, you see that um, the X axis represent time. Around two, one o'clock, that you can see that before one o'clock, only a few behavior models, I'm sorry, I didn't uh, say this. The Y axis are the different behavior models that we actually uh, recognized. You can see that around one o'clock, before one o'clock in the afternoon, there's only one, two, three, four, probably about four attack behavior models that we recognize. And after one, probably 120, 130 time frame, there are a lot more attack models being created. You can see that the rest of these models are created after 120, 130 time frame. What that is telling us is very interesting. This makes sense because for this particular uh, penetration testing competition, that all the teams, we actually did a post interview for them. Mostly they spend their morning times to scan, to find out what they can do. And they, during the lunch time, they regroup, regroup and talk about what their strategy in the afternoon is. And then right after the lunch time, they started real attacking and kind of dig into those vulnerabilities. So you can see those emerging behaviors happening um, in the critical behavior happening in the afternoon, all right? So that's kind of a matches to what we interviewed the teams, uh, what they are telling us, all right? Again, on the right-hand side are the different model a histogram. On the left-hand side, you see which part of topology has that model. And then you can uh, dive in to look at a specific uh, uh, pair of IPs or other group collection of alerts to analyze behaviors. So one set of results I will share with you is the following. So you may ask, so why do you care about separating the collection alerts and recognizing this behavior? What does that do to us? I mean, what does that mean to practitioners? So going back to my earlier comment, I believe that practitioners are always overwhelmed by alerts, a lot of alerts, and not sure what is important or not. So our purpose is to help predictability, uh, meaning that can you use only a subset of alerts to help you predict better what might be happening next second, next minute, and so on and so forth. So what we're plotting here is a red versus blue. Blue means that if you don't separate the alerts, you look at all the alerts you have at, that, uh, uh, at any given point of time, cumulative up to that point of time, you make a prediction based on whatever uh, statistically is telling you. Versus uh, after, after you use a search, you have separated the alerts into different groups. You use that as your basis to, to look at statistic, what might be happening. So red is almost always better than the blue. You can see the one on the top and see the one at the bottom. I'm going to focus on top first. It's almost always better. Of course, it's not going to be 0.9 all the time because we're looking at individual cases. Sometimes you have a behavior model that was just starting, only have a very, very few evidences. So the histogram will not be good for you to have a 0.9, 0.7 kind of predictability. But it could be down. But it's always better than the blue. Okay? So that's for all the feature values. In this particular case, I'm showing you the, the predictability of uh, signatures, uh, uh, Sericata signatures that we're predicting. Uh, well, at the bottom, we're also looking at, can we predict unseen signatures? Meaning that this has not been shown uh, on the, based on statistic up to time T yet. Can we do a better, can we do predict, predictability on that? What we have seen here is that, again, red is better than blue. Red coming from assert, blue coming from no assert, okay? The white axis notice that it's only like 7%, 8%, 9%, very bad predictability. But keep in mind, these are unseen signatures. So telling that an analyst that something not yet seen but will happen is, I think, is very powerful. How do we exactly present that yet? We, I don't know. But um, we definitely see the value of using a cert to say, hey, something new is going to happen uh, pretty soon. You may want to pay attention to. And or even though the predictability is only 10%, but it's better than nothing. All right. So that's what we believe to be the value of a cert. 
uh, I think that every time you did a video and you come go back out and come back in because the glitch of uh, rendering. So the last system that I have, uh, we have done is called Cascades. Cascades uh, is meant to uh, kind of use very limited data as, ever, as, as basis, whether it's observable, so topology information. We want to generate synthetic data so that we can analyze what if, right? What happened if we change the network configuration this way? What if we want to simulate attack behavior, attack capability that's a lot stronger? Uh, what's going to happen? So right now we have a cascade version. We're still working on a lot on this side. Uh, how do we extract uh, the critical behaviors, critical uh, adversary kind of uh, um, strategies and preferences so that we can uh, do the simulation a lot better. So I'm gonna focus on talking about two things we've done on Cascades. The first one is that uh, we have developed something to look at uh, not just uh, the network topology information, the services being used in the systems, but also the adversary's capabilities, opportunity presented to that adversary, the potential intent if we can model that, and the preferences. And in military uh, 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 terminology, the, the COI, the cap capability opportunity intent, are usually the way to look at what adversary might do. We adopted that information, added the preference for cyber adversaries. And we use that to generate uh, these attack scenarios. And we can modify the different kind of attackers' capabilities, different attackers' uh, preferences, and so on, full force, as well as modify the network topology, which we call the virtual terrain, to, to simulate what ifs. Uh, in addition to that, we have used this notion of important sampling uh, in the simulation uh, community to really estimate the likelihood of very rare attack scenarios. We believe that if we're looking at a, a situation where the network is well protected, the likelihood of something that's successful may be at 0.0001% or even lower, right? So for those cases, you're gonna simulate those scenarios, it take a long time, it may not be accurate. So how do we actually uh, simulate uh, those kind of very rare scenarios? Those are two of the things that we have done and we'll show you a little bit about uh, the first one uh, I just mentioned. So this is Cascade running. Uh, we actually have this, what we call the virtual terrain. You can see the different boxes have different colors. That means that we are simulating a scenario where surely everything's green, everything's okay. Then when you start running it, you may see the scenario where some of the boxes become yellow. That means they've been discovered. Some boxes become red. It means that they become prone compliments. All of these boxes that are real, uh, services, vulnerability reference to CVD, uh, MVD database, and uh, the, the CVEs, and so on and so forth, allowing us to model that what kind of attack might transpire, what they've been successful, and so on and so forth. We also have a, a element, say, model zero day attacks as well. And on, on the bottom over here, that shows the statistics of uh, very different scenarios are they successful, not successful, and so on and so forth. So once you run this, you can go back to analyze different scenarios, but can also generate just tons of text files that allow you to analyze uh, what might be transpiring, what might be successful and not successful, and uh, how many steps does the attacker use and so on and so forth. So I'm reporting to you in, uh, in this slide two sets of results. Uh, the first set of results on the top. We're looking at the network topology like the left over here. Here's a target 1002, a target over here. They're hidden behind multiple layers of firewall. Here's the internet. And we're simulating four kinds of uh, adversaries. Amateur and expert are the really targets we're kind of comparing. Comprehensive and random are not real attack behaviors. They're just uh, serving as baseline for us to understand. Comprehensive means that the attack behavior is going to try everything. Render is just maybe trying to, whatever is the next test could be possibly done, try render. Expert and amateur, we, we coded in some kind of specific intent and behavior preference they have. Particularly, the big difference between amateur and expert are the capabilities. Experts know more things to do, amateur doesn't know everything to do. Okay, you can see that we can compare between amateur and expert, that uh, expert taking a fewer steps to accomplish their goals, and their failure rate is lower as well. Now, we actually did something to change the configuration somewhere over here. Uh, I forgot the exact uh, misconfiguration we changed. 
we just change one single thing, we're looking at a percent change on the steps for amateur and expert. It turns out amateur takes a long time. Even though there's a misconfiguration on the network allowing the expert to take advantage of that, uh, but the amateur couldn't because amateur couldn't really discover that particular uh, misconfiguration in time. Okay, it helps all others, but not amateur. On the bottom is another set of results where we look at the rare event simulation. You look at the y-axis over here, it's a 10 to the minus five. So this network is modeling after some kind of health uh, a healthcare facility where people's x-ray images are stored somewhere over here. And to get in here is very, very difficult. So the likelihood to get there by default, the base case is about three to the 10 to the minus five. Now, if we do different scenarios and modify a connection, we move a connection, we try to create a new duplicate machines and, and turning some machines from public to private, we try different kind of ways to see whether that real event can be, can be lowered down by how much. This precision, this arrow bar shows that uh, we have done a very good precision on that. And this is done in, in a very timely manner, only a couple, uh, I think a few minutes, a couple hours at most to run a lot of scenarios to demonstrate that it, we can also do real event simulation of what ifs, okay? So that's Cascades. More recently, I have two more slides. More recently, we started, hmm, the glitch keep happening, so I need to load, come out and come back in. So more recently, because of all this experience, um, understanding, analyzing evidences, intrusion alerts, we start asking the question, so why couldn't we learn them well? Are there things that we should do to really get it better? So we started exploring, I have a student, we started exploring the use of generative adversarial networks again try to see to learn and recreate intrusion alerts and thinking about the recreating scenarios, not even extrapolating scenarios, just recreating the same scenarios. Can we do that? Can we use GAN to do that? GAN has been shown to do very well, reasonably well for images and other things, but can GAN use for this purpose? So we select specifically four features, your signature, the core numbers for destination, source IP, and the uh, time being that uh, some alert happens. So what we have found is that the graph on the left shows a number in each box. A, D, S, T are four different features. So it recovers the signature pretty well, D pretty well. As you get closer and closer joint distribution, the difference between the generated scenarios, generated alerts versus the ground truth alerts, they're not getting worse, they're getting worse and worse if you look in the joint distributions. Of course, we expect that. So the blue lines represent, it actually goes down not that far from 0 0.722, 0 0.749 to 0 0.716. So this alert signature and destination port combination seems to be recovered pretty well. And if you keep going, some of this not recovered very well. So we've seen that. So we ask ourselves why? We're really asking the question, how can, can we use GAN in some way to configure it, change the loss function, do something about it so that you can capture the higher order features, higher order feature dependencies to compensate lower order reoccurrences. What I meant by this is the following. Think about if there's a particular signature on an alert that's very rare in the entire data set, but that's very critical. And it turns out that particular port or particular source IP or particular time that this signature was used is very uh, deterministic. So entropy is very, very low. Think about entropy being very, very low. If that's the case, can we leverage that conditional entropy, conditional probability, so that can learn A better, that particular A value better, even though that A as a whole, of that particular value in A distribution, in the distribution within A itself is very rare. How can we do that? If we can do that, then I think that we can really recreating the alerts that focus on the critical ones, but not being overwhelmed by the ones that has a very high, uh, large distribution to dominant our learning process. So this is ongoing work to share with our community to kind of ask this question, why can't we learn well? Why can't we predict well? Is there some reason that the learning system is being predominant by the uh, heavily distributed uh, the, uh, uh, feature values? The other thing that we discovered and learned over the past several years is how important visualization is in prediction, in anticipation. I mean, this is probably preaching to acquire again, but the point is that 
it is non-trivial in my opinion that how to convince analysts, how to convince people working in a practitioner to say, hey, I made a prediction to you, uh, take it or leave it, right? You must be able to present it in a way that they can understand, trust the prediction in some way. When I say trust, doesn't mean that they always take it and, 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 and take the forecast and not, not worrying about it. Is be able to understand what the values this forecast, these predictions are bringing to them and not taking them as just everything I need to trust, everything that's happening. So how do we do that? How do we use the visualization to provide interactive uh, kind of experience for the analyst? All right, so that's another thing that we've been working on recently. All right, to this end, I want to conclude my uh, presentation. Um, I want to recap pretty quickly that uh, capture, using capture, we try to address the challenge of unreliable uh, forecasting due to this uh, non-stationary and very insignificant signals. And we have done this uh, late uh, feature selection, constant drift to address those problems. We see opportunities to work with people to develop other unconventional sensors and also uh, in, to deal with a lot of this kind of uh, uh, um, signals that we, we as an RIT on our side, we may not have all the capability to develop them. In terms of assert that we deal with the challenge in finding these unknown small needles from the stakes of haze in a very timely manner, uh, in other words, a critical behaviors. Again, we're not trying to look at critical alerts, we're looking at critical collection of alerts. Um, so it, it, the opportunity here that we want to work with people to understand that what's important was uh, uh, for, for practitioners to use and what kind of features are really critical. This may not be just finding the most important features. This may be finding the most critical features from analyst perspective and what kind of visualization can we develop. Last but not least, uh, we believe there's a lot of needs to things aside, simulate attack scenarios. We just will not have enough uh, scenarios there for us to understand and analyze what we can do. So we have developed these prototypes to do it. We're kind of work on how do we extract uh, from limited data to generate more. Uh, we believe the opportunity here is to work with both practitioners and scientists, uh, more from social science perspective, to learn and simulate adversary behavior. I'm actually working with a professor in criminology, uh, criminal justice, so that to have some grounding on the theories on how adversary thinks and make decisions. All right, thank you for your attention and appreciate uh, your feedback and questions and a lot of discussions. Uh, I think we have a few minutes. Yes. Also, I, I would love to see you uh, in, uh, in Chicago on June 19th. There's a transition to practice workshop over there. I've been invited. I plan to be there. I'd love to show you our demo, get your feedback uh, if we couldn't cover everything today. Yeah. Thank you, Jay, for mentioning that. So um, what I'll do is I'll grab the screen real quick. Um, that, that URL will, will reappear later uh, in, I'll stop in, here. in my slides. Uh, I think I can grab it from you, but... Uh, I just, I want to give people some time to type uh, questions, and while they do that, I will go over uh, a few more uh, things that are coming up with Trusted CI. So first, let's uh, request that those of you who are attending, uh, if you wouldn't mind taking our survey, and I just put that here in the chat. Uh, we really appreciate the feedback, and we'd like to know if these are interesting topics to you, or if you have other topics you'd like to hear more about. And uh, in addition, um, if you want to present, we, we'd, like to, we'd like to hear back from you. So uh, just uh, take the survey and let us know what you think. And then uh, I have a few more important uh, details to cover uh, with Trusted CI. So first, let's talk about that TTP workshop. So June 19th in Chicago, uh, if you want more information about that, uh, go to trustedci.org slash TTP. And uh, this, is, this is a new project for Trusted CI. We're just launching our tr technology tr transition to practice program. And uh, Jay will be attending. This is an opportunity for cybersecurity researchers and practitioners to discuss the needs and gaps we can fill with cybersecurity research and enjoy co-creation of plans on accelerating this valuable research to practice. Uh, participants are researchers and pr practitioners in cybersecurity. Uh, there is limited seating for this uh, workshop, so we are taking applications to attend, and then you will receive notification if it's been approved. 
And another topic, uh, Trusted CI is, is accepting engagement applications. Uh, so you can apply at trustedci.org slash application. Uh, the application deadline is April 3rd. Uh, we notify people if they've been approved May 1st, and then we start the kickoff engagement. Now, our engagements are opportunities for Trusted CI to work with projects in some field of security that, that they feel is necessary. There's more information about the types of services that we provide uh, on our website, but it essentially is our opportunity to work with the community and improve security. And then... Uh, Oh, and also for more information about that, we, we did a presentation last year uh, with Vaughn Welch, who is our director, and he essentially is presenting what is the application, what is the engagement, what, what are we offering, what's the process. So if you want more information about that, you can go to this YouTube video. I'm just gonna post it right here in the chat. And then one more thing, uh, we are launching this, the Cybersecurity Fellows Program. Uh, this is a program that we announced last week. Uh, the Fellows Program will establish and support a network of fellows with diversity in both geography and scientific discipline. These fellows will have access to training and other resources to foster their professional development in cybersecurity. And in exchange, they will champion cybersecurity for science in their scientific and geographic communities. They will communicate challenges and uh, successful practices to trusted CI. Uh, we are accepting applications to become a fellow. And if you are interested in the fellows program, you can go to trustedci.org uh, slash fellows. And I'll just grab that URL real quick and put it in the chat. Okay, so I think we had someone raise their hand and so I'm um, let me just uh, pull up the participants really quickly here. Uh, if they raised their hand, I think they might have lowered it. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, uh, those of you who are watching right now, you can go ahead and type them in the chat. And uh, okay, I think I think maybe people are still typing, but uh, Jay, I just want to thank you so much for uh, this presentation. And this research is, is very interesting. I, I was formerly on the BRO project. And so uh, I, can, I, I get excited about these TTP, TTP programs because uh, BRO is kind of one of the first uh, well-known uh, TTP, TTP programs. <laughs> it's hard to say real quickly, isn't it? <laughs> Yes, uh, I think that uh, we are at a stage where uh, several projects, whether it's funded through NSF or IRPAR uh, or other projects earlier, we, we feel that uh, we, there are a lot of science in it, but there's a lot of uh, more user feedback. Uh, what could be a potential use of them that we really want to get a sense of? So LRIT that we do uh, value the real impact of research. So we, we, we love to work with, uh, I don't know in the, in the attendees today, are they, all, are they all researchers or are they uh, a lot of practitioners? I definitely love to hear some feedback, um, what might be valuable, what may make no sense. And can, I mean, I'm okay to take criticisms. <laughs> so it's actually important for us to, to understand and get a feeling that what might make sense. Like I said, early in the beginning, I feel that uh, the community has uh, been still primarily looking at more reactive, uh, passive kind of a cyber defense kind of mechanism. Uh, I think community definitely can use help to look at more uh, predictive, more uh, uh, kind of anticipatory uh, type of cyber defense going forward. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, Florence just asked me just to uh, repost that URL for the TTT TTP a workshop. And uh, so I just, I posted the shorter version. It's a little easier for you guys to remember. So if you go to trustedci.org slash TTP, you'll find a link to our workshop. And uh, we have a question here. 
How do you think about defense after getting a good understanding, analyzing, and prediction prediction of attacks? So I, I, I I'm I'm trying to interpret what that question means. I, I think that the question may be meaning that uh, after have a good understanding, analyzing, prediction, what do we do about it? Right. So it's a more uh, what kind of action can be done through the defense? So certainly, if that's a question. So if that's a question, I think certainly there's a lot of work being done in moving target defense. In fact, our cascade has an option where we are looking at uh, how do we incorporate the simulation of the effect of moving target defense. I'm mean, using MTD as a very general term, uh, particularly the one that the, 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 the type of MTD we implemented in the cascade as an option is a service, uh, the, like a service hopping. So uh, hopping on different kinds of services. Uh, we didn't implement the IP harping and there are other things that people have done. So that definitely that's one of them. Um, I, we have not explored in terms of offense options from defense perspective. Uh, the, the other thing definitely one can do is changing your firewall rule, blocking some kind of a source IP, those elements. Uh, we have not integrated that with anything that we have done yet, but definitely that's uh, doable. Uh, one, one of the, the uh, challenges we, we want to really want to address is um, what kind of features people care. So if I ask the audience today, if we have a poll to say, do you care about predicting the target IP that will be attacked next? Source IP they'll be attacking next? Or the type of service being attacked next? Or uh, the type of exploits? What do you care the most? If we have a poll, for the, the, the defense community. I'm, I'm curious about what that would look like. Um, so what, what do we care more? And that might also depend on time scale. If you're we're talking about predicting the next minute versus next day, maybe very different. And that person said that, yes, uh, your understanding of the question was what they were asking. Okay. Uh, well, I'm gonna go through one more slide real quick before we wrap things up. Uh, and I'll allow people to type in more questions if they have any. So uh, the Trusted CI webinar series, if you've got, uh, if you wanna know more about our presentations, if you wanna join our, our announcements mailing list where we communicate these presentations, uh, find us at trustedci.org slash webinars. Our next webinar is March 25th at 11 a.m. Eastern. The topic is the secure cloud and our speaker is Casimir De Cusatis, uh, De Cusatis and, uh, with that, I will ask for last, uh, last questions. All oh, right, we've got one here. Uh, thanks, Jay. Knowing the type of service that might be attack, attacked next would be very helpful. With limited resources for defense, what services should we focus more efforts on? Thank you for the feedback. Definitely that actually coincide with, uh, I went to one of the academic conferences. That was uh, an answer that I got as well. Yeah, service, type of service. Thank you. And Jeanette, if I could uh, just make a comment, it's Florence, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Excellent. Um, well, thank you, Jeanette, so much and everyone for joining and, and Jay for being our first TTP cybersecurity researcher to present on one of these webinars. Um, so anyone who's interested in joining the workshop on June 19th in Chicago, um, it's free. Um, you can join for free. It's at, uh, Microsoft is graciously hosting it at the Aon Center. And we're looking for researchers and practitioners that can really discuss the cybersecurity needs and gaps we have and potential ways to solve the challenges as Jay just mentioned. So um, AI and ML for cybersecurity will be one of the key topics. Uh, we'll have a panel of researchers and practitioners. So if you're really interested in being on that panel, let me know. Um, we're also looking at an IoT CPS topic, Internet of Things and Cyber-Physical Systems. Um, we also have some other researchers um, coming in and we're going to look for thematic panels. And we will have a panel as well on transition to practice, best practices, and success stories. And so Jim Basney will be presenting on CI Logon. We're reaching out to a few other researchers. And then we'll be spending time
time in uh, breakout workshops actually talking about, so what should we try to do together? How do we accelerate this research into practice? How do we make cyberspace safer? So we really look forward to you attending or letting your friends know about it. And if you have any questions, um, we actually have a TTP at trustedci.org um, email address as well. And thank you so much for hosting us, Jeanette. Happy to do it. Uh, last call for questions. And uh, well, if people are typing, I just want to thank, thank you, Jay, very much for presenting uh, your, your research here. I think this is very interesting. And I, I'm very happy that we get to share it with the, the cybersecurity community. And uh, Florence, thank you for joining us in this talk. Thank you. Great job, Jeanette and Jay. Thank you, Jeanette, and thank you, Florence, again. My pleasure. So I think we're going to uh, wrap things up. So I'll go ahead and stop recording. <laughs>